It's a reading from one of the ancient Hebrew prophets, Jeremiah. I'm going to read a piece from the earlier part in chapter 8, and then a piece from the later part in chapter 31. I drown in grief. I'm heartsick. Oh, listen, please listen. It's the cry of my dear people reverberating throughout the country. Is God no longer in Zion? Has the sovereign gone away? Can you tell me why they flaunt their plaything gods, their silly imported no gods before me? The crops are in. The summer is over, but for us, nothing's changed. We're still waiting to be rescued. For my dear broken people, I'm heartbroken. I weep, seized by grief. Are there no healing ointments in Gilead? Isn't there a doctor in the house? So why can't something be done to heal and save my dear, dear people? And from chapter 31, this is the way God put it. They found grace out in the desert, these people who survived the killing. Israel, out looking for a place to rest, met God looking for them. God told them, I've never quit loving you and never will. Expect love, love, and more love. And so now I'll start over with you and build you up again, dear young and innocent Israel. You'll resume your singing, grabbing tambourines and joining the dance. You'll go back to your old work of planting vineyards on the Samaritan hillsides and sit back and enjoy the fruit. Oh, how you'll enjoy those harvests. The time's coming when watchmen will call out from the hilltops of Ephraim, on your feet, let's go to Zion, go to meet our God. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. What is breaking your heart right now? What is breaking your heart right now? Or if that question doesn't resonate for you today, what has really broken your heart in your life in the past? What is breaking your heart is a question we use in the inner king training that I sometimes take time away from church to lead. I did that this past May. It turns out this is a potent question in helping people experience unconditional love and blessing in their lives. It's a portal. And that includes being a portal for people of Christian faith, especially a people professing the social gospel, the prophetic gospel, a gospel that might change lives and our collective life as humanity. Now, if you have been able to keep feeling during these times of pandemic, of rising inequality, of authoritarian vitriol and violence, and of the Earth's struggle to bear the burdens we humans put on her, you likely have experienced heartbreak. If you are part of a historically marginalized group, you have known it most, if not all your life. There are so many opportunities for heartbreak in this life, aren't there? Now we just heard the prophetic voice speak of heartbreak. In the first part of the scripture reading, we just heard chapter eight of Jeremiah, the prophet channels the voice of God, brokenhearted, for the 6th century BCE siege of Jerusalem that led to the downfall of the southern realm of Judah 
and the exile of many into Babylon. The divine here pleads like a parent over the bed of her dying child, heartbroken that there is no balm in Gilead, no physician to stem the suffering and death. Jeremiah speaks of drowning in grief and wondering if God has simply left their land, left the building. And Jeremiah is expressing here heartbreak, plain and simple as he sees destruction coming for the people. That's the prophet who sees with the lens of the divine, feels the heart of the divine, encounters the reality of the day with the sense of the divine. And so often what is seen and felt and sensed is the reality of what we might call the empire system of Pharaoh or Caesar or Putin or Mao or Trump or whichever representative of the domination system is current. For those who are in touch with the love and justice of God, with the good news of Jesus, or with the loving and liberated state named in another faith tradition, this encounter with the system of empire is painful and truly heartbreaking. Instead of grace, there is harsh judgment. Instead of freedom, there is bondage and oppression. Instead of connection and community, there is alienation and suspicion. Instead of cooperation and solidarity, there is accusation and fear. Instead of peace, there is violence. Instead of the growing and life-giving power of the earth, there is a sense of life draining away as the earth is dominated. A powerful book, The Prophetic Imagination, by Hebrew Bible scholar Walter Brueggemann, reminds us that the prophetic imagination begins then with the willingness and ability to feel anguish and to express grief in the face of and the experience of empire or empire consciousness, that consciousness of domination and of fear and of separation by all the isms. Simply put, in the face of this encounter, for the faithful prophet, there is heartbreak. So I wonder if we have allowed ourselves to really feel the heartbreak of that gap, that gap between life and history as we've so often known it and the beloved community as God has dreamed of it. It's important because that heartbreak is our connection to our yearning for God's intended vision of peace and justice and freedom. And that kind of yearning for something else is a source of life force, a soul force, a spirit force that we need. It is our deep tunnel to hope, our birth canal to new hope and life in God, to the alternative consciousness of God's faithful community. For the Hebrew tradition, this yearning life force feeling generates prophetic vision and prophetic proclamation. The prophets were the one, ones to herald God's dream, God's activity and coming, not as fortune tellers and future predictors, but as voices of the present moment, seeing into the deeper currents of God's longing and God's activity to liberate. When God heard the cry of the Hebrews, Moses was called to proclaim another reality amidst the darkness of slavery and Pharaoh's way of thinking. When the Israelites had established themselves in Palestine, even to the point in Solomon's time of building a great temple for God to live in, the prophets eventually spoke against that regime, seeing that now Israel had become like Pharaoh, content with the status quo 
that tried to domesticate God and ignore the cries of the oppressed and ignore the imbalance and injustice of such an unequal sharing of the blessings of life. As Brueggemann notes in his book, it's the prophet's job to bring forth a new consciousness, an alternative to the imperial consciousness of Pharaoh or of the established monarchy or of the Roman Empire and more recently of the European colonizing powers, including eventually the United States. And for us in the USA, our dreams of freedom and justice for all have certainly been imperfect, unevenly distributed, obstructed, distorted, and blinded because they were contaminated by colonial empire-building consciousness. Our self-evident truths cannot be realized in this state of mind. We need God's alternative consciousness, the alternative sacred vision, the divine heart that we witnessed in the good news proclaimed and lived by Jesus. Now, prophets old and new bring forth God's alternative consciousness in two ways, and this is what I'm talking about this morning. They do it first by speaking another truth to the current colonial or empire consciousness, and then by energizing those open to the new way, the new light amidst darkness. But they critique that old system most effectively, not by moralizing, but by presenting their heartbreak. By presenting their heartbreak and the heartbreak of God for what is happening. Amidst the illusion and trance and numbness of the empire status quo that said, everything is all right, just go shop, watch TV, cruise the internet, just let us have more authority and we'll make it all great again. The prophet instead remains vulnerable to wounding, remains compassionate and therefore awake. And from that place voices the heartbreak of God, expressing the grief of those whose cries refuse to be heard. I hope you're aware of Jane Goodall, the wise elder, scientist, and earth advocate. Jane Goodall, heartbroken upon realizing the profound intelligence and heart of chimpanzees because she knew that they were also being contained in laboratories in five by five iron cages alone. Years ago then, she set about to get those kin of ours freed. But she did it not by yelling and pointing fingers, but by staying close to her heartbreak, telling stories of those intelligent feeling chimpanzees to those organizing the research. Her storytelling powerfully proclaimed another story another narrative of what chimpanzees were and what a respectful relationship to them would be. That's the work of a prophet. Now the cautionary tale here for those of us open to the prophetic and to worthy causes is to make sure our voices do not merely become brittle, partisan, moralizing voices pointing the finger at the evil other. The prophets instead rooted their voice in the divine heartbreak of the ones crying out. They broke the spell of the dominant status quo, not with white papers or resolutions or character assassinations, but with images and voices of the grief of those unheard and unseen of the pain of the inconvenient truths of the empire and with the proclamation of the presence of the God of compassion and justice. It's only after the prophet proclaims divine heartbreak and acknowledges the felt cost of the imperial consciousness, what it costs us and the earth, 
the injustice built into colonial achievements and pain required by those illusory values that enslave or dominate or discriminate against some for the purpose of others, only then the prophet can bring the energy of hope to those poor in spirit, to those crying out, to those brokenhearted ones. That's where we get to the second part of the reading today. We heard from Jeremiah in the midst of the darkness of exile, Jeremiah proclaims God's faithfulness in a new day, a day of justice when those who plant shall enjoy the fruit, when those who have been crying shall sing with joy again. Grief, heartbreak, it's a way of connecting, actually. The heartbreak we allow ourselves to feel if we acknowledge the suffering, suffering of those shut out of history's voice, those left behind in globalization, those impacted by global warming, those discriminated against. It's a way to reconnect with those marginalized people, a way to reestablish the human family, to stay with the great circle. And this applies to ourselves and our inner life as well. Now, remember last week, Pastor Jane Ann spoke so well of the macro and the micro, of the patterns that repeat in large and small forms in the world. It's like that. It's like that for our collective and our individual lives. The prophet, yes, speaks to society and the empires of history, no doubt, hallelujah. But also to the ways of empire we internalize. We internalize by dominating and neglecting some parts within ourselves. When we shut out God's grace and justice within. And feeling heartbreak for those parts of ourselves that are dominated, neglected, wounded, or silenced is also a way of reconnecting to those parts, to ourselves. That is also worthy of grief. It opens us to grace and hope. So for the world and the worlds within us, heartbreak is the prophetic way of acknowledging what is not right or well and beginning the process of reigniting that hope. Reigniting the hope that brings it back from exile and death to healing and life. And following that divine heart through heartbreak. Did you hear it in Jeremiah? Jeremiah, as the prophet, is able to find hope. It reads like this in the, the message version that was shared this morning. God told them, I've never quit loving you and never will expect love, love, and more love. And so now I'll start over with you and build you up again. It goes on later, you'll resume your singing, grabbing tambourines and joining the dance. I know you do that a lot here. <laughs> you'll go back to your old work of planting vineyards on the Samaritan hillsides and sit back and enjoy the fruit. Oh, how you'll enjoy those harvests. The time's coming when watchmen will call out from the hilltops of Ephraim, on your feet, let's go. To Zion, go to meet our God. He's talking about a celebration, about hope, about something different than their suffering. How beautiful. What good news for the poor of the world and for the poor parts within us. And so this morning, friends, I invite us to be a prophetic community of faith like this, honoring the prophetic way of knowing and expressing the divine heartbreak and grief of what is not well, what is in exile, what is worthy of tears in the dark places of history and society, of the self 
and the soul. And then in the faithful way of the prophet, the heartbreak can actually be the beginning of the journey to divine hope. And so let us have faith both in the heartbreak and the hope. Amen.